Doug Casey used to say the U.S. dollar is the worst currency in the world with the sole exception of all the others. I remember myself uh, selling to the Chinese uh, around 2010, 2011, 2012, and to other Asian nations, but having frank, fairly frank conversations about the U.S. dollar, asking them whether they trust us. This example, they, no, but we trust you way more than we trust each other, <laughs> meaning <laughs> other emerging economies. Uh, I, I remember describing to the manager of an Asian sovereign wealth fund uh, the fact that I, while I was flattered that they were investing in U.S. Treasury securities, mm -hmm. uh, thinking relative to the credit quality, uh, whether they thought the U.S. government was honest. And they said, well, ultimately, of course, it's a lie. This is a quote. But yours is a deep and liquid lie, unlike the other lies that we're told. Think uh, about what backs a brick currency. Who owes you seniority or sovereignty? Uh, think about the fact that all the currencies which would be constituent or all of the domestic political and monetary systems which would be consistent, uh, pardon me, uh, which would be constituents, uh, they're mostly themselves opaque and non-convertible. Uh, right. Think about the fact that until 25 or 30 years ago, the Russians and the Chinese were engaged in a shooting war across the Amur River. Uh, what the BRICS system will ultimately be, if it becomes anything, is a trade settlements mechanism. If the BRICS countries really believed that there was going to be a currency, they wouldn't be buying gold because they wouldn't need a medium of exchange. They could conjure one up. Imagine yourself as Xi and imagine a circumstance where you thought over the course of a year, you would have a $150 billion trade surplus with the Russians. What do you want from Russia? A little bit of fertilizer, some natural gas, maybe some vodka. Uh, how much vodka are the Chinese going to drink? In 2023, the US dollar accounted for over 60% of global foreign exchange reserves, yet its dominance faces increasing scrutiny. Financial expert Rick Rule delves into this complex reality, revealing that despite its flaws, the US dollar remains the primary medium of exchange due to deep-rooted trust issues among emerging economies. He recounts candid conversations with Asian sovereign wealth managers who, despite recognizing the U.S. government's inconsistencies, still prefer the dollar over other currencies. Rule highlights a striking quote, describing the dollar as a deep and liquid lie, emphasizing its relative transparency compared to other opaque and non-convertible currencies. Furthermore, Rule explains the strategic moves of BRICS countries, noting that their significant gold purchases signal skepticism about creating a unified currency. He also touches on the implications of US sanctions, which enforce compliance even among non-American entities through systems like Swiss banking. Rick Rule also addresses a looming generational debt crisis, pointing out that the current generation faces a $100 trillion burden due to previous policies. He urges individuals to become anti-fragile, preparing themselves to withstand and thrive amidst economic volatility. So now imagine that you end up with a bunch of IUUs from the Russians. Uh, how do you turn it into something that you want? Do you counterclaim against the South Africans? Hmm. How about the Brazilians? Maybe Bolivia pays you off. <laughs> you get where I'm going? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Good point. The primary medium of exchange, uh, I think, for the balance of my lifetime, will be the U.S. dollar. I think that there will be some disintermediation out of the U.S. dollar in terms of bilateral settlements, but that those bilateral settlements will have really 90-day settlements. Mm -hmm. and, and I bet you that the de facto settlement mechanism will be U.S. dollars. Uh, pick a country in the world and complain about bullying at the hands of the U.S., and you are popular. <laughs> right. I see. Okay. Yeah. So this oh. is probably why we're going to war now, right? <laughs> well, that's the other thing. I mean, we're forcing them. It, 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 whether or not you agree with what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, the, the fact is that we stole $300 billion worth of U.S. Treasury securities owned by the Russians. Mm -hmm. 
suppose Correct. that you're another country and you think that your policies may get you in difficulty with the U.S. dollar. You think there was a lesson there? Uh, think about the fact that the U.S. dollar enforced sanctions between two third parties, no Americans, through the SWIFT banking system. In other words, we constrain the Belgians in terms of doing business with Iran uh, or North Korea or somebody else that they might want to do business with. The enemy of the U.S. dollar is not in Brussels or, or in Moscow or in Shanghai. The enemy of the U.S. dollar is in Washington. Right. We're right. responsible for the origination of the BRIC system. As well, that great political philosopher Pogo once said, I have met the enemy and he is us. I don't know if you're old enough to remember those Pogo cartoons. Um, I have invested in a, a few technologies around the digi digi digitization of financial markets and commodities. Uh, back at Sprott, uh, we did the same thing. Sprott maintains those investments. Mm -hmm. We're watching very carefully the work that the World Gold Council is doing with industry, including Acnego Eagle. Okay. Uh, a, a very good uh, former partner of mine, Peter Groskopf, is a, on the board of directors of the World Gold Council and also on the board mm -hmm. of directors of Agnico Eagle. He's sort mm -hmm. of my de facto consultant uh, well, as to where this is going technologically. Uh, I must admit at age 71, I prefer to rely on a 54-year-old. There's some conjunction in part of my argument and yours, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say that increasing control by intergovernmental elites is always something they want to yep. the extent that they could leave less control over our purchasing and savings decisions to ourselves and accrue more of it to themselves uh, that would certainly be in their instinct in their interest i actually don't think they're smart enough uh to do it in a conspiratorial sense uh, i know that the hard money movement has been hotbed of conspiracy theory for my whole time in it uh there's been a discussion that there's been a decade long or decades long conspiracy as an example to press the price of silver mm -hmm. they didn't need to do that <laughs> the price was going to go down all by itself you know <laughs> yeah yeah well you did. i mean yes is it manipulated overnight as an example of trading desks of course all currencies are but these yeah. great big conspiracies in my experience have required uh too much intelligence and too much planning and too much discipline right. to occur my friend doug casey again describes a lot of these government people as people of medium capabilities from good families who were it not for God's jobs in government would wear a mask and a gun to a 7-eleven uh in other words not necessarily the kind of people who could maintain a, a thoroughgoing uh conspiracy yeah. uh to the extent that circumstances A, allowed it, and B, warranted, that would be a different circumstance. I also don't think that the government needs to work very hard to foster increasing reliance on government by individuals, because that's what individuals want. I don't happen to think it's a good thing for them, but I think people vote because they want to impose their wills and their value on other people. They don't want to be reliant on themselves for their success or failure. They certainly don't want to be blamed for their success or failure. They want to be able to blame other people. Uh, right. And so in that sense, I don't think the government needs to work too hard to foster reliance on the government, because I think it's that very reliance on the government that assigns our actual enemy right. <laughs> the courage, unfortunately. I think that's the greatest problem in the world. Uh, yes. Really, truly the greatest problem in the world is that people don't understand the concept of voluntary exchange uh, and the concept that one acquires material wealth by generating more utility than one consumes. <laughs> it isn't about assignment, it's about creation. Look at people your age, okay? Uh, without any view of conspiracy, you need to deal with the fact that my generation voted itself $100 trillion worth of benefits and forgot to pay for it. OK, <laughs> I mean, that's Good over. Point. Right. So you need to decide amongst yourself whether you do what might be considered to be the right thing, which is to say you guys voted yourselves these benefits. You pay for them. We're not going to. 
uh, tough thing to do politically. Uh, or you understand that you're going to pay in and not get any benefits from it at all. Uh, really, really, really interesting challenge. Uh, and as the as the friction from that challenge increases, what you really need to decide is how you're going to protect yourself. That's what you need to decide. Uh, whether what you say in terms of a reset takes place in dramatic fashion, or whether simply uh, the friction generated by competing voting blocks, young and old, white and black, rich and poor, whatever it is, bricks, right. uh, generates so much risk that the volatility that's a consequence of that friction uh, destabilizes your life. Uh, the answers, the, the probabilistic answers, there's no absolute answer, the probabilistic uh, answer in either of those scenarios is roughly similar. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to become individually anti-fragile, irrespective of how you think it plays. I'm not discounting what you say. Uh, I'm suggesting to you that if the investing vanguard and the voting vanguard around the world thinks that your response is alarmist, uh, if they're incrementalists rather than alarmists, the strategy is the same. Yeah, It's unchanged.